It's a real pleasure to be with you today to really explore some issues that I know emergency managers are concerned about. Uh, the title of the talk, as you see, is Why We Underprepare for Disasters. And I want to focus on that issue and suggest ways that one might be able to do a better job in that preparation process. And you'll understand a bit more uh, as I go through it why we have some challenges. And I think you'll all be aware of them in ways that uh, you can help me even better understand essentially the challenges that you face. And I look forward to that kind of interaction in the future. So let me start with a photo that I took with my wife about a year and a half ago when we were in Leeds Castle in England. The one thing I was not prepared to see were the number of black swans that you see here. There's a famous book, a book that you may be aware of, and if not, you may want to look at, called The Black Swan by Nicholas Taleb, which indicates that these are very low, that we have a challenge in dealing with low probability, high consequence events. And the reason for showing you this particular photo is that we are now having more black swans we have to deal with. We have events that were very low probability a number of years ago, and they are now much higher probability. And therefore, I think it's appropriate to put something out here to say that there are these black swans that we may see more of than we have in the past. So having said that, Karen was kind enough to mention this book, The Ostrich Paradox, Why We Underprepare for Disasters. This is a book that was written with my co-director of the Risk Center, Bob Meyer, and the two of us were really, really concerned with the challenges that we face in dealing with these low probability, high consequence events. And the book was really designed to try to not only talk about these events, but then to uh, these, these challenges and biases, uh, but also to suggest ways that we could deal with them. Now, one question that I'm, uh, I will just pose for you uh, is why did we call call it the ostrich paradox. You should learn about ostriches. They don't bury their heads in the sand. We are the ones who bury our heads in the sand. And that's why we call it the ostrich paradox. And it's on that note that I want to sort of set the tone for what I'll be talking about over the next few minutes with respect to how we deal with this. Now, the framework that we tend to follow with respect to a lot of the research that we do, and that was a motivating force in our work on the ostrich paradox, is a book by Daniel Kahneman, uh, and a psychologist who won the Nobel Prize in economics because of his incredibly important work in decision making and the risk and uncertainty. And he wrote a book, Thinking Fast and Slow and actually summarized a lot of the research that had been going on that he was an integral part of, but a lot of other people did, with respect to how people deal with these, uh, uh, with decision making under uncertainty. And he actually talked about system one and system two, which I'm gonna briefly summarize right now. System one being intuitive thinking, and system two being deliberative thinking, and indicated the fact that most of our decisions that we make every day are based upon intuitive thinking, where we automatically and quickly make these decisions. We look at our past experience. We know when to brake. We know when to stop when we drive a car. People in firms know a whole set of decisions that they have to make with respect to um, uh, their production decisions and marketing decisions. Emergency management agents, you know a whole set of things that you may have learned in the past. Uh, and FEMA obviously has similar ways that they're dealing with these problems, but the challenge is with low probability, high consequence events, we don't do very well. And the notion is we focus on our emotions and making our intuitive decisions. We also look at past experience. And of course, if we have a lot of past experience, we can make better decisions. The low probability events, by definition, we don't have that past experience. And as a result, we have a hard time dealing with that. And we have a set of biases and heuristics, simplified decision rules that we utilize when we are making these decisions. 
What we would like to do, and that system too, is more deliberative thinking. Can we figure out a way to improve the decision-making process to think long-term, to think about interconnectedness, to do a set of things that I could maybe teach in, in, a, in a class on benefit cost analysis or risk analysis, making trade-offs, et cetera, but we tend not to do these with these low probability events. The other point I want to make that Kahneman makes and I feel is very important, we make our, make many of our decisions extremely well with intuitive thinking. And so we shouldn't say that we shouldn't do that. But we do have these challenges that I think is the reason we're all here today for dealing with these low probability events. So what I want to go through now is a few of the biases that we talk about in the ostrich paradox, but that there are many, uh, there are others as well, but highlight these as challenges for preparedness. And I also want to indicate to, to you that in some sense, all of you as emergency managers recognize some of these things. And and may even say, look, we, people shouldn't be doing the things that, that they should be preparing for disasters. They should be protecting themselves. But the problem really is that we don't do that. And you know that far better than I do in terms of how they address that. And so that's what we're going to talk about. And we'll then suggest the role that a behavioral risk audit can play in terms of addressing this. So let me go through the, each of these biases in turn. So you, so you put them on the table. First is myopia, the idea that we have very short-term horizons and uh, time horizons. And people very much want to actually get something back in the short run. When you take protection against a disaster, the, you are really looking at a much longer time horizon. If you make your house safer, it's not just for next year or the next few years, it's for the life of the house. But if people are thinking about only the next few years, they're not going to want to incur these upfront costs, even if it turns out they may get a, a premium reduction because it'll be a lot lower than the cost that they have to pay, the upfront cost of paying. So that's one bias. A second bias is amnesia. Amnesia, we forget lessons of the past. People might buy buy an insurance premium after a disaster. They often don't buy it before unless they are forced to buy it. And then a few years later, they're going to cancel their policy. They're going to say, look at all the premiums that I've wasted here. I haven't gotten anything back. It's really hard to tell people that the best return on an insurance policy is no return at all. You should celebrate the fact that you haven't had a return. People say, look at what I could have done with all those premiums. And then and they forget what has happened in the past. A third bias related to that is optimism, which happens often before a disaster. It's not going to happen to me. It happens to someone else, but I don't want to think about it. This particular disaster, this event is below my threshold level of concern. I'm not even going to think about protection or whatnot. And, and as you notice, these things are all combining with each other as you have to make decisions. Here's a fourth bias, inertia. Let's just keep the status quo. Why should we be changing our behavior? And so people will tend not to want to buy insurance to protect themselves if they haven't done it in the past. And they'll just uh, tie that uh, with respect to their previous behavior. Simplification. Simplification is interesting in the sense that when you think about protecting against a disaster, you should be putting together the likelihood of the event and the consequences. Before a disaster, there's a tendency to focus on the likelihood of the event. It's not going to happen to me. After the disaster, just the opposite. We'll focus on the consequences. That's when people buy insurance, after something happens. You should be putting the two together in making those decisions, but there's a tendency to focus on one of the dimensions, and it may change depending on what actually happens. And finally, herding. Let's follow our neighbors. Let's follow our friends. What they do, we should do. Well, they may not know anything better than what, I, what you know. And as a result of that, you're all making decisions that are imperfect. I will tell you very quickly my first experience, uh, one personal example of following that was these kinds of biases. I bought my first set of battery cables 
only after my car didn't start. A number of years ago now, and the cost of towing was a lot more expensive than what it would have been if had I bought those cables. So we're all, we all are subject to that. And the point that Bob Meyer and I make in this ostrich paradox I'm going to make now is we're not going to change people. We're not going to change decision makers, organizations. We have these biases. Let's work with them. So let me briefly go through each of the biases and some just suggest some remedies. And we could elaborate that on it. And if you have questions, on that, we can discuss that after my talk. First bias, myopia. Rather than sort of requiring an upfront cost, why not have a mitigation loan tied to the property and at the same time give people an insurance premium reduction, flood insurance or homeowners insurance, because now your house is safer and the claims are going to be lower. If it's a cost-effective mitigation measure, the actual cost of the loan will be less than the insurance premium reduction, so every year you're going to get a benefit, and you can pass that on to another homeowner if you sell your house. So that's one way to get the myo to address myopia. Amnesia. We've been talking about this. Very hard to do. But let's push the idea of a multi-year insurance policy so people don't cancel it right away and they have a policy for several years. And that could be done and we hope it can be done. And then at that point, if people don't have a claim, they have that policy for more than one year, two, three or five year policy. Not easy, but let's put it on the table as a possibility. Optimism. This is one we can deal with, and FEMA has dealt with it very effectively, and we've done experiments, as have others, on this. Stretch the time horizon. What does it mean to stretch the time horizon? When you say to a person, there's a one in a hundred chance of a flood occurring, like you're in the hundred year floodplain, they say, oh, one hundred year, one in a hundred? One in 500, that's very low. I'm not going to worry. I'm just focused on one in 100 for the moment. But if you tell them that there's a one in four chance of having at least one of those floods over the next 30 years, which is what FEMA is now doing as part of their marketing strategy, people pay attention. And we've done experiments on that. And let me just say, those two probabilities are identical. There's no difference between them. We've just stretched the time horizon. That would even be higher than one in four with climate change and actually increasing probabilities. So stretching the time horizon might help in that respect. Inertia. Now, inertia is something that has been looked at a great deal. Status quo. Why don't we keep the status quo? On a lot of other areas, we want to propose it for insurance. And the way we would propose it is to say, why not put, for example, flood insurance on a homeowner's policy? And instead of saying you can buy it as a separate policy, find a way to put it on and then give the person the opportunity to opt out of coverage. And there's a lot of data that shows when you do it that way, people are going to decide they want to keep their policy. And you can also tell them homeowners doesn't cover flood. So you really do want that policy and add on to that. So that's another possible way to actually deal with it. Simplification. Well, one way to deal with simplification before a disaster is tell people what the consequences are, what a worst case scenario would look like, and what would happen to them if they didn't have insurance or if they hadn't mitigated their homes. So force them to think about the worst case scenario rather than actually th saying to them, boy, uh, you don't have anything to worry about. This is such a low probability event. And we would hope insurance agents and others could play that role along with you as emergency managers to highlight essentially what could happen if this is not occurred. And finally, herding. Very challenging. The one way that we would sort of suggest you might think about that is houses that are mitigated put a seal of approval on the house and say to people, look, this house is mitigated and it's got a seal of approval. Maybe who, one agency could give them that, an inspector could give them that. And in, in return, they're going to get a higher property value when they try to sell their house. And this, of course, we know works very well with certain things like recycling. Everyone wants to put their yellow can out because they see other people have put their yellow cans out, at least in our community. And you may be the same here. And this would be one way to sort of possibly address that. So these are the challenges. These are this. Now, let me say a few things before I talk about how we actually might want to be doing this. The first thing is that we have to recognize 
it's not just one of these biases. It's a combination of all of these that are going to make the difference. And so it isn't just myopia. It's myopia coupled with op uh, optimism, coupled with inertia, coupled with amnesia. All these things play a role. So build in strategies that recognize that you have to sort of not necessarily just address one. The second thing that I think is important to highlight is this is only a first step. I should tell you my background is as an economist. I am often called an irrational economist for some of the things I'm just telling you about. I'm now more of a behavioral economist than an irrational one, because this has now become a very important part of the, the literature with uh, Nudge and Thaler and Sunstein and with Daniel Kahneman's work and others. So this is basically a first step. You frame the problem, you get people to think about it in a different way. But you've got to, in our opinion, uh, is tied with economic incentives. Make it sh such that people benefit in the short run. That's why loans are an important component to this in terms of spreading the upfront costs, because it actually means that people don't have to pay so much right up front. And so an economic incentive coupled with the notion of getting people to pay attention is a good way uh, to maybe bring them together. So having said that, let me raise some future challenges. One challenge that I'm sure has been mentioned, but let me highlight this, is bring the key stakeholders together. It isn't just you as emergency managers. There's the real estate community. There's the developers, the insurance industry. There's a local community, the local government, state government, and of course the federal government. All of these people have to be brought in. And uh, highlight the fact that they all have to be paying attention to preparing for a d disaster. That may not be hard for real estate agents, but if you say property values are going to go up as a result of that, and they could make a case for that, maybe you could get them to be successful. Second, how can information on protective measures and their importance uh, be communicated? Risk communication is really important here, and that's why stretching the time horizon, as an example, is one of a number of things you can do so people will pay attention to to the risk rather than say it won't happen to them. And finally, what are the next steps to implementing a policy? This is exactly what we are trying to do with our Wharton Risk Management and Decision Process Center. I have to end with a couple of conclusions. One is, given the new era of catastrophes, we need key stakeholders to agree on the importance of investing in protection and indicating it will not happen to me. Secondly, the behavioral risk audit is designed to encourage deliberative thinking. That's what it's designed to do. But, and it's designed to do that recognizing that we do a lot of intuitive thinking. We have to bring these two together in a way. And I really look forward to actually interacting with a number of you on ways that we can do this and that you as emergency managers can do that. We need you desperately to help in this process along with a lot of the other key stakeholders. I will end very quickly with a final slide, which was given to me, I will tell you, by one of my co colleagues for many years, Larry Larson. I always like to uh, say that I didn't find this, but I like to use it. And here is the challenges of linking flood insurance with adaptation measures. I'll look at this down, why Jerry looked into flood insurance but says it's too damned expensive. This may be one way to deal with the problem, but we're not necessarily suggesting this as a solution. Thank you very much. As uh, I've indicated, it's not easy. But I think the ways that one could do it is to focus on things that people have experienced or know about. So if one talks about Hurricane Sandy, or Katrina for that matter, which occurred a while back, events that were serious, and even in Miami, Hurricane Andrew is still paying, uh, people in Florida still know about that. But recent events, events that people could actually focus on, is I think one way to actually actually deal with this. The other is to even talk about near misses. Hurricane Dorian is an example of something that we were paying a great deal of attention to, and Florida could have been hit very, very hard. And I think indicating to people that if you have a disaster like that that is going to hit your community, the damage could be very, very severe. And then I would, uh, I would invoke the uh, simplification bias by focusing on the worst case scenarios and telling people, look, if this disaster occurred, you're now thinking about it. Think about the consequences if you haven't prepared, if you haven't mitigated. So I would try to first 
must bring in experience, which is part of intuitive thinking. Highlight also the emotional part. That would be another part. You want to sleep well at night. Peace of mind, thinking about the fact that if you're protected, you don't have to worry about that when someone tells you a disaster could hit. We would really want to get together with the relevant stakeholders who would express an interest to us that they would really like to think about this and that we would express an interest to them. We haven't done as much of that. We've done that in the past with a number of different stakeholders, but on the preparedness program, it would be a great opportunity, I would say, uh, to follow through with you and others as to how we could work together with them and do that. But we haven't done it at the moment. We've done that clearly uh, with uh, FEMA and with the insurance industry and whatnot, highlighting the fact that mitigation has to be tied in with insurance and with protections and that there's a combination of these things. But with the new programs, it would be very, very interesting to have a session with them on two levels. One is, how do we communicate these programs to people so that they actually are willing to think about them? Uh, the Institute for Business, Home, and Safety, who we have worked very closely with, and that would be an example, uh, we could, could begin to talk about better, better structures and roofs and whatnot. And then the second part would be not only to tell them about it, but to say, here are the incentives. Here's the reason you want to do this. And that would require them tying it in with, with um, lower insurance premiums or, or, make, or seals of approval, for example, would be an example which has been used in the past. So we'd be very interested in doing that, but uh, we need to do more. I think the answer is yes. You should, one could do that. Uh, and when I, I do teach a course, I've taught a course in risk analysis, and I always introduce these biases as an important part. And students will actually look at the assessment of the risk, number one, what do we know? Then we say, look, there's perception of the risk. We better be, figure out how people are perceiving it. And if we don't do both of those, it's going to be very hard to deal with a risk management strategy. So I think there are ways along those lines, uh, and I've tried to do a bit of that in, in this particular course. But I think I think at the same time, one has to highlight we're, not, we're going to have to live with these things. That's what I would say. You can't really do a great job of all of a sudden saying people shouldn't be myopic. We are. We, we do want to get short-term returns, but I think it can be done.